We are in the book of Ephesians. Uh, I think you know that by now. Um, so we'll be looking at that again today. Ephesians chapter 2, you have notes. Um, we'll just read from that, the scripture, that way we're all on the same. I know this as a fact that we probably have a half a dozen versions out here, so we'll just read this one. I'm going to jump to the bottom of the page. Now, this is a letter. Uh, nobody writes letters anymore, but this is a letter. This is a letter to a church. And I got a feeling they treasured that letter and they read it over and over and it got passed out from house to house. Hey, we got a letter from the Apostle Paul. He's in Rome. He's under house arrest, but this letter got here. And he wants to make sure that we're staying on course. And he's sharing some very deep things of God. He came, this is in the middle of the chapter, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father, but by one spirit, the Jews and the Gentiles. He used the term in the last week that, or a couple of weeks ago, one new man, taking both sides, the Gentiles and the Jews. In previous weeks, we've done Ephesians 1, you're chosen, adopted, redeemed, forgiven. We talked last week about your pre-existing con condition and then your partnership in the gospel. Verse 19, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, also members of his household. Come on in, kids. This is home. When we run the, the uh, announcements up here now, it says, now it says it's time to come home because I believe we're in the days uh, near the coming of our Lord. Verse 20, built, how's this household built? Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. He's building something. He's building, obviously, a people. Bottom of the page, just a couple of things for thoughts. This is where we're going. Foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. It means we're going to have to tear down walls to build walls of separation have to come down for the temple to go up. So anything that divides us has got to come down. There's a lot of division in churches today. Uh, I've mentioned it uh, several times recently as I read what's being posted, what's being uh, written in different Christian articles about this group doesn't like this group and this group thinks that group is a heretic and it, it just goes on and on. And I, and I realize everybody's looking for a, a purity or a truth that they can cling to, and so we all think we're the ones that have it. You, you guys over there, you don't have it. And, and I'm seeing it over and over again, and it's, it's, uh, it's discouraging to see that kind of division in the body of Christ. And, uh, but, it, but it's there. It's real, and Satan's having fun with it. All right, so when you're going to build in the, in, the, in the times that he's writing this, the first thing you had to do was set a huge cornerstone, a big rock. We, we kind of see that now with, uh, they replicate it. They don't actually do it that way anymore. But you've ever seen a, a, maybe an old college or an old library or something, and it says erected in 1921. The whole idea is that this is the cornerstone. This is where it began. This is where, it, you know, we, we set everything now leans against this place. And Paul says, just like that cornerstone 
holds that building, Jesus is that for you. And so there's three little blanks here, and they'll go really fast. You can't start, the word is start, the very first one, start. The little blank there, start. It all starts with Christ, the chief cornerstone. Everything starts with him, all right? And I'm going to jump from that, look down below that, those three little blanks. There's a verse from uh, Matthew 16. Simon Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. This is where Jesus says to them, hey, who do people say that I am? Well, let me think. Uh, some think you're one of the prophets. Maybe you're Jeremiah. Maybe you're John the Baptist, resurrected or, you know, reincarnated or something. And then he goes, well, who do you think that I am? The big question everybody has to answer. And, and, of course, Simon Peter said, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. How does anybody know Christ, or how does anybody know God? God reveals himself through his spirit. All right. And I tell you that you are Peter, and, upon, and on this rock, not on Peter, on this rock, this truth, I will build my church. Who's going to do it? Jesus. And the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not overcome it. So he's the first. He's the first. He's the rock. He's the center. Not the center, but the first part of the building. And just think of it this way. I don't, I, you know, maybe you had an old lean-to somewhere, whatever. But everything leans toward this rock. Everything's supported by that stone. So that's where it starts. You, you find us. Well, where are we gonna, how, are we gonna, how big do you want this building to be? Oh, I want it to be this big. Okay, well, then you're going to need this bigger rock for this all to lean on. And so there's Christ, our chief cornerstone. And what does that rock do? It brings stability. That's your second word, stability. I got prayed this morning already. This world, I don't know if you pay any attention to it. You can ignore it maybe, but it's chaotic. It's just chaos. How many people were killed this week? Chicago, Philadelphia, big cities, small cities. Kansas City, how many? How many policemen died in the last couple of weeks? I, I know of about five. It's just, there, there's no right or wrong. It's chaotic. How many saw the, the uh, owner of a store that defended himself and now he got arrested in New York? And all he did was defend himself. What, what, kind of, what kind of chaos is going on in our nation? And again, before we, we want to attack our officials, and we should probably, you vote them in and out or you write them letters or whatever you do. But behind that is a, is a darkness, a spiritual force that is just running loose. And, I, and I, I just feel like this, this isn't in your notes, I just feel like this. Maybe I'm wrong, and you can correct me in eternity sometime. But it's almost like God's going, this is what you want. This is what you're going to get. Is this what you want to pursue? You want to pursue the evil and the dark? I, I feel like a Star Wars movie. We're all being drawn to the dark side. And, and it's just chaos. And this is what we're getting when we do that. When we don't lean or trust in this cornerstone, when we don't lean on that, this is what you get. Chaos. And so he's the start of it. He brings stability and then he brings strength. Because it's long lasting. Once that building is up, it's going to stand. Once the church is totally up and functioning like it's supposed to, it's going to stand for all eternity because he said it would. It will. I will build my church and nothing's going to stop it. Nothing. I, I quoted a, a, a thing that I got, from, sorry, from a Pentecostal guy. I don't think he was a Southern Baptist Pentecostal. But I love it. I've been saying it to myself and sometimes. I learn verses, but also pick up other things. And it's, maybe you'll remember this. Get back, Jordan. Roll back, Red Sea. Fall down, Jericho Wall. You can't stop me. That's what he's trying to tell us. I'm the cornerstone. Everything, I'll support you. I'll be your support from now through eternity. I will be the start of it. I'll be the stability in it. That means it's going to last a long time, and I'll be the strength for you to carry out the mission that I've called you to. He's the cornerstone. It stands. It does not move. Now, 
Psalm 116, this was the problem they were having, and, it, and Jesus repeats it later in Matthew, but Psalm 118, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. It is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. They rejected that, that Israel, that the Jewish people said no. He said the stone the builders rejected. They said no, we don't want that one. And he goes, but he became our chief cornerstone. Those that the world will reject will be your savior. My cornerstone is, you fill it in. It's blank. You have to write it in. Because kind of like other verses in the Bible, if you put anything in there besides Jesus, then your building's going to fall. It's not going to stand. Right there it says, I wrote the word example so I wouldn't forget it. From Matthew 7, 24, 27. Do you remember the builder, they're building? Two men are building. One builds on the rock, one builds on the sand. The storm hits both, which tells us all that we're all going to have storms, right? Everybody's going to have one. The people that are lost, the people that are saved, we're all going to have them. But the one that was built on the rock stood. You're going to make it to eternity? You you better have your house built on the rock upon Jesus Christ. He has to be your cornerstone where everything starts, where you get stability for life and strength. All right. So interesting thing, though, that Paul does here with, with this verse to me. I, um, now, we would get that. All right. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus is the start. He's my stability. He's, he's my savior. He's my Lord. He's my soon and coming king. All those things that we say. But then he goes on to say, the foundation, after we've got this stone, we have, we have a foundation. And it goes from the apostles and the prophets. So we better look at what they were doing so that we'll know if we're on track. Are we building by the apostles and the prophets his, his exact words? foundation of the apostles and prophets. That's what we're building on. Somebody's gone before us, presented the word of God and the word of truth, and we're supposed to act on that. Now, it's pretty simple. Uh, right there, there's a blank. Apostles, the 12. When he says the apostles, who is it? And there's arguments today in church structures and things. Do we have apostles today? And I'll let you argue that. We just changed the names. There are men who watch over whole areas and things like that, but we don't call them apostles. I don't know. Anyway, so we're going to build it upon the apostles. All right, there's Acts 2.42. This is right after the day of Pentecost. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So we've got to pay it. What are they teaching? Talk about that in a minute. And to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property, possessions to give to everyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So they're going to, they we're going to do something. The church has just been born. The spirit has just come. We've heard different languages. We've understood it. We're taking some of that back home with us. Think of where all those people came from. They took that home. God's plan. But as we follow the apostles, what are they, what are they telling us? Number one at the top of your page, testimony. Testimony. Do you have a Testimony. Do you, have, do you have a time when you were lost and then you were saved? Do you have, a, and I always like to add this, do you have a testimony of God's goodness since that time? Well, I got saved in 1942, and uh, I guess he still likes me. I'm still here. Have you talked to him since 1942? 
Have you heard from him? Have you prayed? Have you been in the scripture? Do I have a testimony from the last few weeks of God's goodness or God's blessing? I should have a testimony. Yes, I have a testimony of when I was saved. But do I have testimonies of his goodness ever since? Or did he just, did he leave me there? Okay, you're in. Move on. Next. And forget me? No. His goodness, his grace, his love, forgiveness, all those things I attained when I was saved, I still have those. I'm still redeemed. He's still good to me. So they have a, they have a testimony and I'm thinking as, as I say that, and how they met him, think about how some of the disciples met him, you know, out on the boat. He goes, come on, guys, let's go. And they all just leave everything behind. Or Matthew, the tax collector, sitting at a tax booth. Come on, Matthew, let's go. And they leave everything behind. That's their testimony. I left it all behind. And people go, wow, he must really be worth following. Well, he is. He is. That's their testimony. I left it all. I left, I left my parents, my dad on the boat with the servants. I left the nets, the fishing poles. And sooner or later, I quit smelling like a fish and began to smell like a disciple. It took a while. So, so this is their testimony. So it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Where do you always start? With your testimony. And then the next word is just very simple. It's the same word, teaching, classroom. It's where you would sit in, in homes. Remember, they're going house to house. And they would sit and retell what happened to them and how Jesus touched people's lives and how they witnessed it. We are eyewitnesses of his majesty, Peter says. We've seen him. We've walked with him. We, we watched him touch the blind and they saw and the lame walked. The deaf hear, the demons were scattered and thrown out. We, we've seen it all. And this is how he did it. And this is how we do it. We do it all in the name of Jesus. Think about when Peter and John went up to the temple to pray in the Acts chapter 3. And they go up and he goes, Silver and gold have I none, but what I give thee, I give thee in the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, arise and walk. He goes, see, that's what we learned. That's how we learned to do it. It wasn't my strength. It wasn't our holiness. It wasn't our perfection. It wasn't our power. It's his. And when we recognized that, we were able to touch lives and do some miraculous things. And so over and over, the testimonies, the teaching, this is how you do it. Going back to Old Testament, telling them how this relates to where we are how it fulfills the prophetic things that Jesus is coming. So they have this testimony and they have the teaching. And then I, I, I separated this. The word is training. This is where you make disciples. It's not, it's not just coming to church and receiving. That's a good thing. That's part of it. But then it's out during the week when I'm with somebody, I share again. I can share. What are you doing? You're discipling. When somebody needs prayer, you go, okay, this is how we're going to pray. And you teach them to pray. And I always tell people, if you don't know what to pray, open your Bible, all right, and read the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just pray the Lord's Prayer. And then stop and start thinking about it. Hallowed be thy name. Who is God? And you don't have to remember, some of you have been through this teaching. I've taught it, and we talk about all the Hebrew names of God. But maybe you just remember, God, I know you're wonderful. God, I can trust you. God, you're glorious. God, you're loving. God, you're kind. That's hollowing his name. And then going on through the prayer. I don't know how to pray. Start there. He gave us a model. So there's training always going on in a church. We're always discipling. Southern Baptists, not just Southern Baptists, Baptists, Methodists, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, all have Bible studies or Sunday schools. What is that? You're discipling. We're learning. We're growing together in smaller groups. And we're learning the word of God and we're sharing our lives together. It's discipling. 
So, so they were uh, sharing their testimonies, they were teaching, and they were training. But he says it's also built. So these are the, it started with these 12. We know one of them falls away. They replace him with, uh, I think his name is Matthias in uh, Acts chapter 2, Acts 1. So these, these 12, and, and they're out doing what God called them to do, and they end up going all over and almost all of them, except for John, are martyred. What a testimony. Jesus is worth living for. Jesus is worth dying for. And that was their lives. So he said, I want you to build on that. Okay? And then he says, the prophets. Now, when you start thinking that, we start thinking about some of the things we do on Sunday nights. We're talking about some of the things happening. But that, that, that's not what they're talking about. Think of that. What do we have, scholars? Like 12 minor prophets and four that we call, I call the big prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then you have all the others, Hosea, Amos, all these guys, Malachi, you can name them. But he says, built on the apostles and the prophets. What do prophets do? Well, let's just walk through this before I get back up into there. Speaking the word of God as directed by God. That's what prophets do. God says, this is what you want. I want you to say to Israel. This is what I want you to say out in front of everybody, to the government officials, to the nations. And then the prophet would go and speak that out. And a lot of times... They were not held in great favor because people, including me, we don't like to be confronted, right? You don't want to be pointed out, but it has to be done. And so the prophets would do whatever God told them to do. And that's key. Speaking word of God in warning of judgment. Well, oh boy, do we see that a lot. I, I, I go back to Jeremiah and he goes, this is what's going to happen. They're going, oh, that's not going to happen. Wow, it does. So there's always a warning. God's trying to tell them, I love you. But you turned away, and there's going to be discipline. Because when it's all done, I want a holy people for myself. So it was always that, and then... Speaking the word of God, and this is what we mostly think of, speaking the word of God in future hope. That's why we like Jeremiah 29, 11 so much, all right? So the promise, you know, of he has a future and a hope for you, not to hurt you and to harm you. We love that verse, but we always forget that what's that come out of? Exile. Coming back. I have a future hope. Now, one of the things I wanted to do um, as I, I read this was, this is an argument in the church, and again, you can argue it if you want to. Find somebody else. Uh, prophets. Were there prophets in the New Testament? Could he have been speaking of New Testament prophets? So what I, I want to read is from, see those little list of verses there? I'm going to go find them. You got a Bible? Let's go find them. Acts chapter 2. This is the day of Pentecost. Acts 2. What verse did I start with? 16. Okay. 16. When they were going, what in the world's going on here, Peter? And Peter stands up and goes, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. He mentions an Old Testament prophet. But what's happening now? In the last days. Are you in the last days? Yes, you are. God says, I will pour my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will what? What? Prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. So now you know if you're young or old. You have visions or dreams. But he said, they're going to do it. They're going to continue to proclaim my word the way I direct them to do it. And so... Today, you, you might, I've, I've heard this said, I, I don't know if people like the terminology, but preachers are prophets. 
That doesn't proclaim future events. That we're not soothsayers. But if you're proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, you're proclaiming who God is, you're prophesying to the world. Again, we always get this idea of, you know, dealing out cards and telling you your future or something. No. Only preach or teach what God directs you to do. And that's a continual work, all right? That's, <laughs> I'm not there. That's a continual work. Now I've got on there 1127. That means I've got to turn my page. I didn't mark them. I've got to go same thing you're doing. All right, 1127. I have no idea what it was. I marked it. I guess I do know. So here's the church of Antioch, okay? Uh, during this time, I think I've got on the verse 27. During this time, some what? Prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Where's Jesus? Seated on his heavenly throne. He's already been crucified, died, resurrected, and ascended. This is the church he left behind. There are prophets coming down from Antioch. Did I get that backwards? Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of these is named Agabus, stood up through the spirit predicted that was a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. Do we have people proclaiming that today? Are, are people now declaring there's going to be a famine? Are there things today people are declaring there's going to be war? Are they declaring gas shortages? There he is. So there are things being spoken. Our, our issue is there's too many false ones. And so we always have to go back and say, Spirit of the Lord, is this somebody fear-mongering? Is this somebody trying to build their own spiritual empire? Is this somebody trying to gather treasure? Or is it you? And so we have, that, that's always a problem. And I think that's where a lot of times people say, well, that can't be real anymore. Satan always fakes the real. So anyway, here comes this prophet from Jerusalem to Antioch, chapter 13, verse 1. Oh, I don't even have to turn a page. You should have got a Bible like mine. Okay, 13, 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Now, we would not argue whether there's teachers today, would we? We'd go, well, there's lots of teachers. We have Sunday school teachers and, and, and all kinds of teachers. School teachers, all kinds of teachers. But in the same sentence, he says there's prophets. What is that? That means somebody has, God has appointed, gifted. You all have different gifts. We have gifts of administration. We have gifts of helps. We, we have all kinds of gifts. And so sometimes somebody can speak something that you just go, wow, man, that really just hit me in the heart. What is that? That's God speaking, using someone. All right, last one, I hope. Let me see. 21.9. Uh-oh, this is going to mess up all my theology right here. It's going to mess up my order. It's going to mess up my life. Isn't that something God does, that sort of stuff? Did I say 21.9? I did. And there, it says they're continuing their voyage. Um, hmm. And so, let's back up. Verse, I think, uh, 8. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who what? What'd they do? They prophesied. Ugh. No. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. You want to change that? I can't. I won't. I refuse. I don't understand it. I don't know what they said. 
But whatever it was, the Holy Spirit says, I want you to know in a godly family, he might have daughters who speak the word of God. Oh. Yeah. When is this? Where is Jesus? On the throne. What's he already done? Paid for the sins of the whole world. Died on a cross. Was buried. Rose again. Ascended. This is the spirit. What the spirit does afterwards. And so when we come to the foundation of the apostles and prophets, we're declaring a holy God. And he still is. And we're still declaring the same word that they were. So we're building on what we have here in Scripture. We're, we're, we're building on the truth of God's Word. We're, we're building on those saints that have gone before and said, this is what happened. This is the way you do it. This is the way you walk. Paul does a lot of that. This is the way you should walk. And so we're still building on the same truths, upon the same cornerstone, on the same foundation. We're building. What's an old song in BBS? Building daily, building. And that's all I remember. So that's probably enough for you. All right. But, but, but that goes on. And then, in the next little blank there, rises up. That's the exact word the scripture uses. In verse 21, in whom the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple. He, he, he starts... With a cornerstone, with Christ. And he laid the foundation with the teachings, the apostles, and the writings of the prophets. And he goes, now, I want you to take that, and I want you to rise up to what I want you to be. Rise up. Rise up. I almost broke into song there. There is a song, rise up. Okay. All right, three, three simple blanks. Rise up to your calling. Rise up to your calling. Again, he, there was a day. Maybe you walked an aisle in a church and you cried at an altar and accepted Christ or you did it at home or you saw something on TV and it stirred your heart. Don't know where that was. But that was just the beginning. And now we begin to grow in our faith and in our knowledge of God. Again, he didn't save you to leave you. He saved you to change you, to keep you. Forever. So calling. The next word I have is community. We have to rise up in community. And that means, that means the same verse I've quoted all the time. They'll know you're my disciples by the way you what? Eat barbecue with one another. No. Or the way you love one another. All right. Love. I never felt so loved. Talked about that last week. I won't belabor that. And then finally, rise up to be what? To be a church. A church. A church. And look at the result. Being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Does God dwell here? Now I know in the Old Testament there were times where the presence of God was so, so we use the word heavy, which is actually the word glory, heavy, that it said the priest couldn't minister. They couldn't even get up. We see that sometimes faked today, unfortunately. But there was such a holy presence of God that they go, we can't even move. We can't do anything. Man, that would be life changing. Now, I want to bring something up, probably more of a, a Sunday night thought, but I, I want you to be aware of it, all of us. So I'm going to lean on the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, and upon his word and about, upon what the apostles and, and the uh, prophets have written. Okay, I'm going to build on that. We're going to build on that. And then we're going to become a church. Real news article. Real news this week, okay? It's not in China. It's not in Russia. It's not in Pakistan. It's not in Iran. It's in Pennsylvania. 
two Pennsylvania churches cited for zoning violations after serving beyond the city's definition of a church. Did you hear about this? So in this area where they are, and like New York, they call them boroughs or counties or provinces, and, and where they are, the uh, poor rate or whatever you call that, destitute rate, is 30% higher than it is anywhere else in Pennsylvania. So these churches are serving in a desperately poor area. So these churches decided they're the church. We're going to serve our community. And what did they do? They started feeding the people in the community. And they started getting in doctors to get free health care. And they started giving out hygiene products, soap, toothpaste, those kinds of things. And they started giving them out. And the city came in, the head of the bureau, oh, here it is, poverty rate 30% greater than anywhere else in the state. Uh, when the housing market boomed in recent years throughout, as it did in a lot of the country, guess what happened? Rent went up. Well, the people couldn't afford the rent. So now they have the highest rate of homelessness than anywhere in the state. And the church says, well, we'll give them. Let's give them a place to live. Let's feed them. Let's, you know, let's put our, our gospel, let's put some uh, feet under this. Not just the word, but let's go out and do it. Homelessness, yeah, increasingly large problem. A couple of churches in the area, they started stepping up to this. Unfortunately, the borough, again, that's their area, has told two churches that doing so places them in violation of the zoning code's definition of a church. Isn't that good that we're going to now tell God what his church is? All right? Because if you don't, we're going to shut you down. Where's this at? Iran, Pakistan, Russia, China, Pennsylvania. Pots down Pennsylvania. You can look it up. I want you to know I don't make this stuff up. All right. Their definition of a church from this government, from the local government, definition of a church is limited to a building wherein persons assemble regularly for re religious worship and that is used only for such purposes and for those necessary activities that are customarily associated therewith. This is the church right here, and you don't practice it out there. Your church is here. We will give you the freedom to worship as long as you keep it where? In your building. I don't make this stuff up. Welcome to the new America. Let this be a warning to all ministries. They're probably going to go to court. They'll probably win. The church will probably win. But it's the fight. Satan loves to wear you out. And finally, one day we'll go, it's not worth it. Well, it is worth it. It is worth it. Then the little secret got out. The real underneath all of this is M-O-N-E-Y. Because this borough wants to plow under all this poor stuff and build new housing and make new revenue. So now they're not only against the local government, they're against a bigger section of government that has a plan to remove all these poor people to where they don't care to build new housing. Isn't that amazing? When it comes out, it looks like, well, it's obviously against the church, number one. And then you find out there's a government agencies behind it who want to move these people out so they can build new homes and get what? Tax dollars. You don't get no tax dollar from homeless people. Let's move them out. See, if you don't contribute to society like they want you to, we don't need you. We'll be talking about that tonight. You'll have to come back and hear that. All right? But, but, but I want you to, to hear that. Um, so now it's opened the door for other places to make the same judgment upon a church that takes the church outside the four walls. We can't do business out here. We had it here. I don't know if you, you probably do remember, I shared this. The only reason I knew it, because my niece was involved. 
uh, where they would go out under bridges and feed people. And the city came in and goes, you can't feed them. You don't have an approved kitchen. And they poured, well, they pour uh, uh, Clorox or what, bleach on all the food so they couldn't eat it, destroyed it all. And you would say, oh, well, maybe we just didn't meet the right regulations. It was the church they were after. It's the church. I'm going to say this now, and I'm going to say it later, and I'm going to keep saying it. Cancel culture will not be done until they take out the church. That's, what it, that's where it's headed. Well, well it's, it's this word, and it's this word, and it's this word. Guess what? It's anything we proclaim. Recently, a man posted. Janice found it. A guy was talking about the church as he saw it, and we love, I, we are love, we are love. We'll love you, we'll care for you, we'll, we'll cry with you, we'll help you, whatever it is. But this guy goes, uh, if your church is preaching that God allows people to go to hell, then you're, that's hate speech and you shouldn't be in a church. Isn't that something? See, that's why I say when I read, <laughs> it's a wonder I don't throw all the lamps in the house. You know, it just, it aggravates me. I don't have that bad a temper. But, but, but I read this stuff and I go, boy, we better get, this is what Paul was concerned about. We better have a foundation. Because if it's religion, you can be talked out of it. But if it's relationship, you can't be. Because no, I have a relationship with the living God. I know him. And you can't take that from me. You can take my building, but you can't take Jesus out of me. You can't do it. So as we read these things, Paul's admonitions about, or they don't sound like admonitions. He's going, look, you got to have a cornerstone. you got to have a foundation. And you better be building on it. And Jesus, back in Matthew 7, you got to build on the rock. And Jesus promised, I'll build my church. That's what we need to know. So this is the world we live in, and this is where Scripture comes to life, and Scripture is real, and we need it. I need the Lord to speak this into me today. Last verse down there, when the, right, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Stand. Stand. Because we, don't, we, don't, we didn't build on the world's foundations. We're building on God's. And it's eternal. It will never change. It will not fade away. All right. Now, it's all started with Paul trying to explain to these people, to the Jews, there is one God, there is one way to the Father, and it's through Jesus Christ. And the Gentiles and the Jews come the same way to build one large community. So there were walls, religious walls that had to come down so they could receive that, accept that, and walk together in love. So what I want to know is, is there any walls that I need to take down today? Is there a wall between me and God I need to take down? Is there a wall between me and somebody else I need to take it down today? Is there somebody I need to give forgiveness to I need to take it down today? Because you will be tested. You will be tried. Let's have all the strength available that heaven can give by walking with the Lord on a daily basis. Let's pray. Father, you are our God. You sent your son Jesus Christ who walked out this life sinless. And as your word says, Builders rejected him as the cornerstone. But in him we have all of our faith and all of our hope. So today we declare Jesus as my cornerstone. And everything I do, I lean on. He's where I get my stability. He's where I get my strength. He's where I get everything. So that my life will not fall apart. Because we are now the temple. And we lean upon the rock, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. And Father, if there's anything, I, I think of when they set a stone, if there wasn't like 
maybe weeds growing up or rubble of some kind or whatever, and they had to clear it all away so they could get a good contact with that cornerstone. So, Father, if we've got any of that uh, dirt and rubble in, in between me and you, let's, let's take care of it today. If there's any weeds growing up between us, let's clear them so that we can have good contact with that cornerstone. Father, if we have never made Christ our Savior, Lord, our cornerstone, this is a great day to make him, to touch him, to lean on him. Then, Father, if we're living in fear and anxiety, may we run back to the stone today. May we go over and lean on and say, God, you're not moving. I'm going to hang on to you. In the midst of a storm and the trials and all the words that are flying around, and that's what a lot of it is, is just words flying. But, Father, that... Uh, after this attack to cause us doubt or grief, we're going to lean hard on you right now. We as a group of believers are going to lean on the rock of Jesus Christ. We're going to cling to that rock. Thank you, Lord, for your love for each one of us. Father, some of us, and I, I love, he didn't realize that I don't know. He did. But when Jim prayed earlier, he said, I don't know if it's sickness, but, Lord, we have a lot of weakness. And I thought, wow, that's a good definition. We need strength today from that cornerstone. We need strength to carry out just the, today. We need strength. And in that strength, I believe, Lord, there's courage. There's faith. So, Lord, if we're lacking that today, we want to come to you and just say, Lord, right where I'm at, right where I'm standing, Lord, would you, would you restore that in me? I give up my thoughts. I give up my feelings. And I just ask for us to be walking together, reconciled. Thank you, Father. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the strength you give and the hope we have in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray.